The last speaker today is Mr. Harish uh, from Indian Space Research Organization. Um, he, he would like to talk about the manned mission, a major program for ISRO for the future, I think within the next decade or so, uh, based on the capabilities that they have built up over the period. Uh, the original paper was to be presented by his colleague, I think, uh, Mr. Uh, Unai Krishnan, uh, but Harish is equally competent uh, scientist from ISRO with 22 years of research and development experience post his um, BTEC in electronics and communication engineering and MS in software systems. He's also an expert in RF communications and avionics and is presently the pro deputy project director, human space flight project at uh, Vikram Sarabhai Space Center Trivandrum and looks after abort sensing and crew escape systems. But I think he will give us an overview of the planned uh, manned mission. Yes, over to Mr. Harish, please. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a uh, very good afternoon to all of you. I am privileged to be here and I thank the organizers for the opportunity. I am extremely happy to make a presentation to this August gathering, especially on a session chaired by Sri Narajan, former SA to Rakshamandri, for whom I have the highest reverence. Thank you, sir, for the nice words about me. I present this paper on behalf of Mr. Unikishna Iyer, who is uh, the Project Director of Human Space Flight Program, uh, Indian Space Research Organization, who was very keen on this presentation and has taken great efforts to make this paper, but unfortunately could not be here today because of a personal tragedy in the family. In the next 30 to 35 minutes, uh, we'll go through uh, the question, how, it is, how a manned mission is different from unmanned mission. Uh, we'll specifically address why we should undertake an unmanned uh, man mission and uh, the benefits that accrue out of such a program. And uh, we'll try to arrive at proper conclusions. As we all know, exploration or the quest to know more things to understand uh, better technologies is what has brought the human being to the technological base that we have today. We have uh, ventured into new areas. We have invented things to make our life more comfortable or to improve the quality of our life. We have con conquered virtually every space in this globe. And finally, uh, we took wings at the dawn of the last century and ventured even into space flight. So the legend says that the first rocket trial was a Chinese by the name Wan Hu. He was a, a, a low-key official of the Ming Dynasty. Fascinated by the space travel, what he did was he attached 47 rockets onto a wicker chair and asked 47 assistants of his to light them simultaneously so that he can go to moon. That was his vision. And as we could foresee, in a moment, there was a tremendous roar accompanied by billowing clouds of smoke. And when the smoke cleared, the flying chair and Van Hu were gone. They were not seen. Now this uh, was recreated by National Geographic by an experiment, what they call as uh, 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 breaking the myths or something like that, a program like that. They, they did a chair like this, put 47 rockets and lighted and understood that the same thing will happen. Uh, now we know that a chair cannot fly because you need to have a flying aerodynamics for the chair. You need the thrust to lift. And we have understood quite a lot of things in the last uh, four or five decades. And now we know how to take a man to space. But in India, we have never ventured into such programs and we are making a small beginning in ISRO these days. And I'll just tell you what we are doing. And the background is all started way back with the Sputnik launch, we all know, in the uh, 50s. Sputnik was launched to commemorate what uh, was known as the International Geophysical Year. Incidentally, International Geophysical Year, or IJY, created a lot of interest in space activities. And a lot of nations started exploring space, especially with what is known as sounding rockets. You, you might have heard about that, to sound the upper atmosphere, to learn more about the atmosphere. 
And we also started uh, to sound the atmosphere uh, in 1963 with borrowed rockets, uh, first from Americans and then from Russians. But we also started somewhere in the early 60s. Uh, our scientific community was also interested. And Sputnik uh, was received by all the amateur radiographers around the world. Sputnik uh, uh, signals were received. And Sputnik 2 had the first uh, uh, living traveler, Leica, the dog which we all know. But unfortunately, Sputnik 2 did not have the capability to re-enter or the proper technology for re-entry. So Leica died when the module was brought back to Earth. So we should also say that Lega was the first casualty of space travel. The third one, the chimp, Ham the Astro Chimp. That is an interesting story. Ham is actually an uh, acronym for Holman Aerospace Medical Research Institute, H-A-M. So this chimpanzee was trained to travel. So he is the first trained traveler to space. When we say trained, he was inducted in 19, he was born in 1957. He was inducted uh, into a training program, which gave him small, mild electric shocks when he did not do what he was asked to do, and gave him banana pellets when he was doing it right. So he was supposed to pull a lever at the site of a bulb. So he was trained to do that, and that he was to do in deep space. So the chimp went into uh, the space and came back safe, and he lived up to 1983. So that was a real input to the flight of Alan Shepard later when he did a space uh, walk in Mercury. A living being could go. But we all know the pioneer in the whole business was Yuri Gagarin, 1960 old hero of Russia who went into space and came back but in a suborbital flight, followed by Valentina Tereshkova and Leonov who did the first space walk. When you look at that modules which have gone to space, they are all very primitive. They are very small, uh, very cramped, and just out of the pride to, or uh, their uh, patriotism to the nation, or, or maybe a cold war with the USA, made these people to cramp into that small modules and go to space. If you look at it now, nobody would dare to uh, do such a feat, because they are all, technologically, they are the bare minimum to go to space, not the complete thing. But they did it in 1950s, and these pioneers, of course, Shepard, I told you, the first man to go in space from uh, USA. The spacewalk, uh, incidentally, the Leonard, uh, Leonov uh, spacewalk was done by an accident blew from the small capsule of uh, Sputnik. It was just a, a, a bloom coming out, and he did a spacewalk very near to that. Very primitive, but very brave efforts, which finally culminated in the Apollo mission, which was very sophisticated. That is the first, uh, if you say, if you look at it, technologically managed program where everything was documented and now it's all declassified. We can go through and we learn quite a lot of things from the project management of Apollo. Everything is planned, everything is tested. There are a lot of uh, flight tests prior to the actual mine flight. So nothing was uh, the first time. Everything that they were doing were done earlier, either at ground or during a flight test. So everything was properly documented. In fact, there's a diary of day-to-day -day activity of Apollo, which is now available, uh, which you can go through and see the amount of intense technical debate that has happened in 62, 69, which has created a lot of technological activity in America, which has created a lot of technology. If you look at it in, in whole, you have a past, which is basically the Vostok, Voskhod, and all from Russia, Mercury, Germany, and Apollo from America. And the present, we have only two players, the, uh, sorry, three players. We have the American Space Shuttle, which goes to orbit regularly, which they have planned to uh, ground shortly, maybe in a year or so. And we have the ever, ever uh, competent, ever reliable Soyuz, which has done more than 235 flights. And we have uh, the Shenzhou of China, uh, which is uh, now developing into a system which is comparable to Soyuz. There are future programs, but if you look at the future, uh, the, uh, the programs of return, uh, it, it's, it's more about safety to the crew, it's more about uh, more importance to not uh, going into challenges like what we did in 60s or uh, 70s, but to go for complete systems with all importance given to crew safety. So uh, the US has got the uh, Orion or the Crew Exploration Vehicle Program, 
ESA is also planning to do uh, uh, collaborative programs with Russia, which they have actually uh, last year decided not to pursue with vigor. Japan has got a uh, plan and they have documented that they will do something in by 2015-2020. Russia, of course, continues with improvements in Soyuz. China plans to do many things, including a space station. But space shuttle, uh, if you look at it, even though technologically it's a marvel, it can it's uh, lifted up by solid boosters, it goes to orbit, uh, it does uh, microgravity experiments, it carries astronauts, but when it comes to safety, that is the worst thing that you can think of in uh, aerospace systems. Either in a launch pad or during ascent or during descent, there is no way the crew can escape if there is an emergency. So that is not the way we will see shortly that we should do a, a manned program. So that is why, even though it has completed 132 flights, even though it is the most complex machine, even though it is the epitome of all the technological marvel that you can think of, in avionics especially, it still is a very unsafe way. If something happens to any of the systems, there is no way the crew can escape. And for the last decade, the one that has stood in aerospace uh, systems as an example or as an epitome of international cooperation is this International Space Station. And that is the theme of our seminar, uh, uh, that is what we can achieve through international cooperation. So basically uh, conceived by five uh, spacefaring nations, uh, I would say spacefaring agencies, NASA, the ESA, uh, the Russian Space Agency, JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency. This particular station has been used by 15 different countries so far for experiments in microgravity and other uh, similar areas. So this is what uh, NASA has pronounced last year. In fact, uh, President Obama in a speech, uh, space policy speech, emphatically said that if we have to pursue uh, flight to Mars or to Moon or to outer space, it should be through international cooperation. So if you look at the accident summary, uh, this uh, slide shows, this actually the curve shows the the actual flight, the ascent, the orbit, and uh, the descent. We had a uh, loss of crew, only very, very uh, minimal, but the major accident are the two space shuttle accidents. One is uh, during the ascent, when the booster uh, failed. The second is uh, when, uh, while re-entry, the tiles failed. The third accident was uh, the first Soyuz flight, where uh, when they were returning, the parachute failed and the uh, cosmonaut died. Otherwise, uh, the human spaceflight uh, program, on the whole, is fairly very, very, very safe because quite a lot of uh, uh, safety features are put into the systems. I look at the aircraft uh, where we are uh, practically in the troposphere or beneath that are pa parachutes which are up to maybe uh, 25, 30, 40 kilometers. We are thinking about space, deep space, deep vacuum, beyond 200 kilometers when we talk about a space flight regime. That is one of the prime difference between the uh, airplane environment or a manned airplane environment and an unmanned. So now, uh, why should we go for a manned mission? <clears throat> so there are many, many arguments, many arguments against a manned mission, uh, mainly telling that man, manned space flights are inherently risky. And even after nearly five decades of manned mission, if you look at it, the, the best reliability that is achieved and that is uh, recorded by the Soyuz is only 0 0.98. 0 0.98 or 0 0.97 is two or three out of 100. There can be a failure in, uh, of two or three in 100 flights. But uh, even now, countries are venturing into such adventurous and risky missions and costly missions because of the many benefits that are offered. So, there are a definite advantage of having an astronaut in space compared to unmanned machines, definitely. Uh, the main thing is the adaptability and dexterity of the humans. Uh, that is what uh, you, you get better capability of dealing with or understanding the unknown when you are actually there. One of the things that is documented in the last decade is the repair of Hubble telescope by the uh, astronauts in space shuttle. Because they were there, they could actually do the repair. Uh, a robot with whatever intelligence, if it is uh, sent to uh, space, 
it will not be able to understand. You know, the, we always uh, often quote uh, the example of uh, the discovery of penicillin uh, by Fleming. Uh, penicillin was accidentally discovered. Uh, it, uh, it is actually a fungus growth. Uh, if it is, uh, it was uh, examined by a robot, he will never understand that it is a medicine. It will just declare it as an unwanted fungus and throw it out. So many of the discoveries, uh, if you look at it, it was done by the dexterity or the, the capability of the human being to interpret the data to his advantage. So that is why we always say an astronaut or a cosmonaut can weigh and relative values and react intelligently to the unexpected and come out with examples or uh, come out with uh, results which are alien to a robot with whatever intelligence you can build into it. So that is why we always say uh, we should have uh, manned missions rather than robotic missions. Uh, even the best state-of-the-art robots at best can go and select a sample from the surface of a planet and come back. But he will not be able to look around and pick out the object that you are looking for. It will be a sample which is, it is programmed to collect. So when we look at the need and the benefits of this program, uh, you can see uh, quite a lot of uh, benefits and needs are there, but we will, uh, we will say we are rather interested in uh, uh, the first two or three points. One is, we, have, uh, we in ISRO have already done quite a lot of uh, satellites. We have uh, successfully launched, launched uh, 47 uh, satellite missions and a lot of launch vehicles. And what is the next logical step that ISRO should take? And uh, it should be, uh, the next logical step seems to be, after uh, doing uh, what we call as a spacecraft recovery experiment, the next logical step should be uh, the uh, human space flight. The second thing what we say is, uh, right now, uh, if, we, if we are not in this club of people uh, sending uh, human beings to space, then uh, at some point of time, if there's a debate on the utilization of space, uh, for the benefit of humankind, you will be left out. You will not be called for the discussion. And even if, even if you are called, you will be in the second line or the third line. You will not be in the uh, table where the discussion takes place. We often quote the example of our an Antarctic expedition. Uh, when we started the Antarctic expedition, India were one of the first uh, few countries who joined the expedition. Now you see we have our own bases. Uh, and when, whenever Antarctica is talked, India is in the forefront uh, discussing about Antarctica and the use of that space. And if you are not into this business, then we are not there. And more importantly, we will be the voice of reason and we, we will uh, represent the third world countries uh, or, or the sort of non-aligned countries in this uh, business of sharing this space. And more importantly, this becomes an investment for the future for a stronger India. When we do a human space flight or for that matter, when we do any new pro uh, programs like uh, technologically intensive program, you develop a technological index for the country. And you, when you improve the technology index, uh, then your value in the world uh, goes up. And uh, these are a lot of tangible and intangible benefits accruing. More than that, there are some political and cultural advantages. You, know, you have a national pride doing this job. We will inspire the youngsters to join the space and aerospace discipline rather than going in for morning. Uh, repeatedly, I heard the expression of going to IT sector, uh, uh, attracting them back to and the basic science programs. And uh, of course, uh, there, are, there are a lot of technological spin-offs. Spin and uh, more than that, we, we improve the industry. And uh, when we say that we improve the industry, we improve the capability of the industry to do, do things. And that capability will be available for many other things as well. But for example, when we say that we build a capability to uh, make an environmental control system, then that is uh, beneficial to the air conditioning industry as, as well. So that way, there are a lot of uh, capability build up uh, in the country, and uh, that uh, leads to economic growth. Uh, if you look at aircraft, we have short duration, and short duration, when we say uh, even if it's 18 hours uh, non-stop non flight from Bombay to uh, USA, uh, it's still uh, less than 24 hours. So that is short duration, and uh, basically we have atmosphere around. So uh, we call it as benign, whereas the deep space missions, are long duration and uh, that is uh, at least uh, a day or, or more, 16 orbits, 17 orbits, and deep space uh, conditions, which means temperature, vacuum, uh, and radiation. 
the challenges in manned mission are uh, uh, first is how to reach the orbit. Uh, of course, you need to have a heavy lift uh, launch vehicle to do that. Then uh, we have the zero g environment in orbit, which we have to uh, survive in. Then, uh, of course, there is a possibility that we can be in a hostile environment. To survive in that hostile environment, we should have the capability, the technology, and the training to do that. And finally, we have to re-enter through the atmosphere and come back safely to Earth. And uh, if you go to the other planets like Moon or Mars, then we don't have the protection of atmosphere and we should know how to live there. So these are the challenges which we have to address. So uh, obviously we have to develop quite a lot of new technologies. And when we say the new technologies in human space flight, basically, they are the crew module systems which uh, incidentally is uh, living habitat for the crew while in ascent or in orbit. Uh, it contains all the functions. We, we try to create the environment of uh, Earth in a module and that module is taken to uh, the orbit. So we, to, to do that we have what is known as environmental control and life support systems. And of course the protective flight suit is there. And uh, we will develop our crew escape system a bit more in the coming slides. And uh, for re-entry, you need to have a uh, robust TPS or thermal protection system, which is a uh, tile-based or a silica uh, uh, ablative-based systems. Of course, uh, we have the health monitoring systems. And uh, more important than that, uh, normally we do a launch vehicle in a fully autonomous mode. No human being is involved. He is not allowed to do anything. But now because the, of the availability of human being inside the module, you use the capability of that man to manage this mission. So that is an entirely new uh, dimension in the sense that the man uh, is useful as well as he can create trouble also. There is a possibility of human error as well as you should use the capability of the man to improve the mission. So that is uh, the uh, man in loop simulation we call, uh, which is very uh, common in aircraft uh, testing, which is very uncommon in uh, spacecraft business. So we the confidence we got uh, to venture into or study into this program is because of the SRE or space capsule, space capsule recovery experiment which we did in 2007. So uh, with this space capsule uh, SRE, what we did was we took a module to the 900 odd kilometer orbit, uh, put it in orbit for some days and brought it back in a controlled way to a predetermined uh, destination in Earth. We said it will land here and it landed with a precision of 15 by six kilometers. Incidentally, it happened on January uh, 22nd, 2007, and with that, we became the member of an elite group. If you recollect, the re-entry experiments by both uh, USA as well as Russia, or USSR at that time, was a failure, the first experiment. So that uh, helped us. Of course, we have, uh, we have had the knowledge base that they had before doing this experiment. So what it enabled it was, in 2007, the International Astronomical Federation awarded SRE the best aerospace experiment of that year. And we were competing with uh, none other than uh, Sea Launcher of uh, Russia. Uh, you know that Sea Launcher, which, uh, which is a launch station which is positioned in equator. So we were competing with that and still we got, uh, we emerged as the winner. So this gave us the confidence to do that. And crew escape, as I said, is a vital system for man mission. Crew escape means if there is any impending failure to the launch vehicle or to the crew module, there should be a viable means of escape for the crew, and he or she should be brought back safely to Earth. This is a, a mandatory requirement which the space shuttle lacks, which all other manned missions have, whether it is Senshu or Soyuz, has a capability. And we all know about the aircraft ejection seat which we have. In case of problem for the uh, aircraft, uh, the pilot simply presses the button and he ejects out. A uh, parachute is deployed and he safely lands. And uh, this uh, is a very safe uh, mechanism for the uh, fighter pilot which enables him to do maneuvers which normally uh, uh, other pilots will not venture into. Similar to that, we have what is known as a crew escape system which is a solid rocket based system kept on top of the launch vehicle. Uh, you can see here. And uh, in case of an impending failure, what happens is that uh, escape motor fires and it pulls the crew module alone from the launch vehicle. It takes the crew module alone from the launch vehicle and it swerves away from the path of the launch vehicle and takes the crew and the crew module to a safe location. This is active right at the launch pad. In fact, in 1983, when our Rakesh Sharma 
was uh, undergoing training in uh, Gagarin city, uh, Russia. He witnessed the launch, and in that launch, a fire engulfed the launch vehicle, and uh, the crew escape system was activated. And uh, the same uh, cosmonaut later traveled along with Rakesh Sharma in his flight. So uh, in the launch pad, uh, because of the fire, the uh, escape system was activated. And the video is now available in the internet. Uh, so uh, the crew was safe. All the three uh, crew uh, escaped. But during uh, Rakesh Sharma's flight, he was telling us when we were discussing with him, the heartbeat of that particular crew member was higher than the other two, because he has already gone through uh, an injection uh, previous to that. But uh, nothing has happened. That is the safety that is built into Soyuz system. So after six months, he was able to do a, a normal uh, mission. So this particular escape system is initiated right at launch pad and during the ascent phase. Once you clear the atmosphere, then you are fairly safe because uh, the, uh, the Gs are lower and you are not in the solid rocket uh, regime. In a liquid engine, we have the capability to shut down the engine and come out. So, uh, but still, you have a viable escape phenomena wherever you are. Uh, in the launch pad, you fire the escape system and take him to a safe distance. If you are fairly into the uh, d space, that is, if you have cleared something like 50 kilometers or 60 kilometers, then, sorry, you abort to an alternate location in Earth. And if you are still higher, you go to an alternate orbit. That we call it as abort to orbit, uh, rather than the determined orbit. So, uh, what we do in a crew module is to have an ECLSS. So, ECLSS does what uh, the, uh, the plants and the animals do in, uh, in the globe. What, what it does is to maintain or to uh, enable uh, the crew to live in an uh, Earth-like condition inside the crew module. So, it contains uh, compensation for the oxygen that is uh, consumed by the crew. That is, it releases oxygen into the atmosphere, into the crew module uh, atmosphere, and uh, it absorbs the carbon dioxide uh, uh, that is generated by the crew, and absorbs all the waste that is generated by the crew, whether it is sweat or other liquid and solid waste. And uh, this is a total system, uh, which Russians uh, use pure oxygen to supplement, whereas uh, there are a combination of different methods to do this. But we uh, plan to do uh, a system where we compensate for the oxygen consumed and we remove the carbon dioxide that is released. And of course, the uh, air conditioning part uh, or maintaining the temperature is done by uh, radiating into outer space. And we absorb the condensate uh, by a mechanism which can work in zero-g environment. So these are the different systems which goes to ECLSS. Another important aspect is a spacesuit, similar to a fighter pilot suit, but here this has to withstand extreme temperatures and it should have the uh, uh, capability to withstand fire. So it basically it is worn inside the spacecraft while during ascent as well as descent. And normally it is not active, but in case of emergency, like a depressurization of the cabin or some fire inside, immediately the uh, astronaut uh, closes his visor then uh, it is inflated, the suit is inflated, and uh, he is safe. And uh, it consists of three to seven layers, depending on what type of suit uh, you are using. And uh, like uh, first suit, uh, to uh, thermal protection, followed by an insulating, uh, then a structural member, then a, a liquid uh, water ventilating system, followed by finally a fire uh, resistant system. So uh, mainly, uh, when we say that we are going to use a launch vehicle for a human spaceflight mission, what we should do is to do a human rating. Human rating is nothing but uh, to make uh, a system uh, more uh, reliable. More reliable, already it is very reliable because uh, we cannot afford to be unreliable in a space mission. Already it is very reliable. So apart from that, what we do is uh, it can now safely have the presence of human being inside it. As I said earlier, that means that you should have a viable crew escape system and we should improve on the margins and if you, you should add on to redundancy. Wherever possible, you put more redundancy. Wherever not possible, you put more margins. Redundancy is not possible, margins have to be improved. So <clears throat> that is, you improve on the tolerance, failure tolerance. Uh, for example, in our uh, launch vehicle, we have dual redundant avionics. Now, in a crew module system, we will have go for uh, fail operational, fail safe uh, systems. That means, uh, with the first failure, we'll be uh, still operational, 
Second failure, we'll go for fully operational systems. Similar to that, uh, uh, there are uh, quite a lot of requirements which has to be followed. Mainly, you improve on uh, the materials, you improve on the crew survival with escape system. You now uh, look at safety uh, first approach. That means now uh, our launch vehicles are designed such that the mission success is of the prime criteria. We declare that the mission should be successful at whatever be the cost. But now we declare that the crew should be safe. So mission success is second. First you make the crew safe and then uh, decide on the mission success. That is a, uh, so we have a certification similar to what you do by Semilac or DGCA for aircraft. We have to have a, a certification uh, policy like that. And uh, space medicine is another, another exciting area where uh, what will happen to a human being when he goes to space. This is especially important when you plan to take people to other planets. Uh, there are short-term uh, effects on human being and long-term effects. Uh, and we should have countermeasures for all that. <clears throat> Another important thing is uh, to enable the crew to make a, a space travel is by training. We have uh, centrifuges and a lot of facilities which you can find typically in our Institute of Aerospace Medicine. Um, majority of the facilities are there, but they are primarily meant for pilot training, but can uh, be modified for our uh, space flight uh, program also. For example, you can see there are uh, zero, zero G training, uh, which is depicted in the first picture. Second is a centrifuge. Third is uh, the the flotation. Final, uh, next one is uh, uh, chamber, water chamber, where zero G uh, uh, normally is simulated by a flight, uh, which goes through a zero G uh, uh, maneuver. Take it to an altitude and dip it. So in, in, in inside you will have zero G environment. This is the first training that is given to astronauts to see that whether they'll be able to survive this serology environment or to get trained in this environment so that they can do skills in serology while in orbit. To sum up, I'll just say there are a lot of advantages in having a space flight. The new technology ideas for development uh, new technology ideas uh, are uh, basically the ECLSs. If you have a space capsule recovery experiment, you put an air conditioner into that, you have a manned uh, module which can come back. It's as simple as that. But you have to improve on the reliability and redundancy. Of course, you have to improve on the technology of the ascent vehicle. You have to build in the human factors into it. There are a lot of uh, short-term and long-term gains associated with these missions. And uh, we have to develop a lot of technologies and uh, Primarily, it is concerned with uh, a gamut of activities, not on the module, not on the flight alone. Uh, thank you very much. So, friends, that was a nice lecture by Mr. Harish on the possibility of a space, uh, human manned uh, space mission, the need for it, the factors that govern the design of such a system and the challenges involved and, and of course also the inquisitiveness of a nation looking to this opportunity for a variety of scientific experiments all uh, depend on the success of this mission. I'm sure they have submitted the paper to the cabinet. <laughs> they would have highlighted uh, the technology uh, levels, readiness that they already have reached in some areas and others that which have to be achieved uh, to make this mission uh, really possible and the kind of time and effort that this will take over the next decade or so. Uh, so it's a broad overview. Quite a few of things are common, similar to the aircraft, but operating in a different environmental conditions that he has highlighted, uh, uh, whether it is materials or whether it is environmental con life support systems or even the crew clothing, uh, crew suit design, apart from the human ratings. Uh, the space medicines he has talked about to sustain the crew in such environmental, harsh environments and the need to train the crew for these kind of missions. Uh, so if we... We'll have five minutes to take any questions, if there are any, from... Because this is the only topic we had on space flight <laughs> today. All others are focused more with on the aircrafts. Uh, 
we have here. Can I continue? Yes, please. Oh, yeah, what is the effect of the recent failure of GSL F06 on the mission? Having the one CS engine in the hand, left one CS in the hand, how it will affect the future mission? Uh, oh, that's, uh, that's a question. Uh, that's why we are still waiting approval for this program. <coughs> See, uh, one failure, uh, if you consider it as a fail, uh, if, if you consider it that particular failure, if it is understood properly, then uh, when in aerospace, what we say is not a failure because if it is unknown, then we cannot move for, forward. As you rightly said, uh, there is a problem of cryo stage. Cryo stage, uh, we don't have Russian cryo stages uh, in numbers with us, but uh, we have our indigenous program which has gone through a failure analysis and we'll come out of it in another year or so. So with that, our cryo stage will be ready and then we plan to use our own cryo stages for the, mis uh, for the future missions. Last uh, failure incidentally was an accident. Uh, more or less, uh, we are converging into the real reason behind it. So, uh, which is not going to affect any of the programs of ISRO. So, but surely, uh, as you rightly said, this is a sentiment that is uh, put forward by the common man. So, we have to clearly demonstrate our capability by successes in the next uh, few months, which we are sure to do. So, with that, uh, all the apprehensions of the uh, common man should be uh, over and uh, we should come out of it. Thank you, sir. Question, please. Sir, may I? Yes. Sir, may I, please? Uh, yes. Sir, uh, you have mentioned this uh, all space uh, missions are more reliable. So, uh, in this case of uh, unmanned or the manned uh, mission, what kind of reliability you are looking at, I mean, what is the, the figure you are looking at, sir? Yeah. Uh, if you look at the human rating uh, guidelines, uh, there is a wonderful uh, NASA uh, report, uh, special report, uh, SP8052, which I would uh, request you to go through. But the main thing is, uh, underlying it is, the system should be fail operational fail safe. See, fail operational fail safe means there should be the mission should continue as if nothing has happened after first failure. And the second failure should be safe. That means even if there is a second failure, that failure should be safe. It should not lead to further failures. And we should be able to come off it. If you apply this criteria to our launch vehicle right now, right now our launch vehicle is fail operational, not fail operational, fail safe. Okay. That means we can tolerate one failure, but not two failures. And the the we have not looked into all systems uh, and seen that whether all the failure conditions will be safe failures. There are some failures which can even trigger uh, more failures. So that means uh, we have to build in more redundancy into the avionics systems, especially in the launch vehicle and in the spacecraft for a manned flight. And we have to improve the margins. Improve the margins in the sense that right now we have a structural margin of 1.25. That means if you have a load of 1, you design to withstand a load of 1.25 for any structures. That will be improved to 1.4. These sort of improvements in margins will come. Pressure vessels, for example, the margin goes to 2. The plumbings, the margin goes to 4 for the human training system. That way, you build in more margins into design. That is the second thing which we have to do. Uh, we All the space, uh, uh, incidentally, all these uh, criteria are followed in an aircraft, especially in a in a uh, passenger aircraft, if you look at it. Uh, in military aircraft, slightly compromised because there is only one man. But passenger aircraft, whatever we have told is right now uh, uh, used. So when it is an unmanned uh, system, uh, we to uh, bring down the cost, we don't put that much redundancy and margins. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So is there any yes? One last question, please. Yeah. Yes, please. The escape in the zero zero condition, that is zero altitude and zero speed. Uh, actually, yeah, we have a positive uh, escape uh, method. You know, in fact, we don't visualize a, a scenario like that, which is actually very relevant in an aircraft. 
whereas uh, in our flight it is always an accelerated flight but in launch pad uh, it's a zero zero condition okay in launch pad when we have not fired the rocket you have a zero zero condition where you have not gained any altitude you have not gained any speed but uh, in that case also we have a mechanism to pull the crew module away from the launch vessel we have rocket assisted escape to come out of it so uh, incidentally it is there uh, from uh, but uh, if you look at it in some phases of the ascent flight where it necessarily it is not zero zero but in uh, uh, some velocity altitude conditions if you fire this uh, uh, escape motor you may subject the crew to uh, what you say as uh, unsafe conditions like more than 4g or uh, more than 4g for more duration right now what we have decided is we will not never we will never exceed 330g second condition that is the duration and the g put together will not exceed 30g 30g seconds that is, if it is 12, 12G, we will fire only for 2.5 seconds. That is a sort of, uh, what do you say, envelope we have in mind. Uh, we may exceed, uh, uh, cert in, in ascend uh, condition, at some point we may exceed these conditions. There, we will declare those points at black points and we will not escape from that point. We will just wait for one more second and come out of that and then escape. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Harish has tried answering these questions, but it will be unfair to expect Harish to be the uh, inquiry chief of the <laughs> investigation that's going on into the GSLV problems. I'm sure the committee will be able to decode. Uh, we, we obviously, when we embark on old missions of this kind, we can't be put back by failures. But we have to intelligently see that failures are kept minimized through scientific application of our procedures and the, our own uh, design philosophies. I think uh, three good papers we have had uh, on this um, innovation and uh, <coughs> space. Innovation, uh, as in the, the morning to all the speakers said, India is a very fascinating country. There are no boundaries or limits to innovation. Very often the school children keep asking these questions as to what, what, do, what does innovation really denote? And we have difficulty in explaining because if you explain too high a thing, it's not easily understandable. But in a country like India, from finding uh, what is called nine different uses of a discarded dalda tin to <laughs> composites being used to develop a cycle <laughs> to the other end, uh, spacecrafts, in, you name the field, we have, we have actual problems, we, we have actual needs uh, to meet with our societal requirements. So I would say to all my youngsters, colleagues, uh, it, it is really up to your imagination to make the best use of science and technology and what you learn, irrespective of which discipline you pursue and how you mingle with you, each other and integrate your thought process and your disciplines to produce goods and values and services for the population of this country. May I say with these words that thank, thanks to the organizers for this opportunity. Thank you indeed.